This is the largest dry zone on Earth, stretching all the way from Morocco to Mongolia. Along a large portion of this latitude, the land is literally drier than a Macca's Big Mac. And yet, for some reason, places at this exact same latitude, like Florida, southern Japan, or northern India, are all lush, green, soaking wet, full of life. Why is it that this one part of the Earth is sucking the life out of an area spanning continents? From the Sahara, through Arabia, across Iran, and into the heart of Central Asia, what you're seeing is over 9,000 kilometers of desert, steppe, and wasteland, covering over 12% of all the lands on Earth. So, what is it exactly that makes this one stretch of the planet so uniquely hostile to life? What if I told you there was a hidden factor at play? A force of nature capable of generating Earth's greatest wasteland like it was a Minecraft seed? And better yet, what secrets does this area hold that could help us better understand our future on this planet? See, you could start near the coast of Morocco, drive all the way east through the Sahara, cross into Arabia, continue through the Middle East and Central Asia, and end up in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, all without seeing a drop of rain. Different cultures, languages, politics spanning continents, but there is one constant. Nothing, as far as the eye can see. The answer to this riddle isn't as simple as some deserts that happen to be near each other. This is one continuous zone where annual rainfall barely reaches 25 centimeters per year, some locations experiencing even less than two. Meanwhile, places at the exact same distance from the equator get regular downpours, flooding, even monsoons. So what force is powerful enough to create a 9,000 kilometer dead zone across the globe? Well, this is where we're gonna have to get a little bit creative. Earth is a giant engine that's constantly pumping out heat now, I know what you're saying, Earth is actually a planet. I mean, technically, yes, but metaphorically for this video, it's an engine. Why? Because it's covered in exhaust pipes. Okay, this metaphor is getting a bit nuts. Let's just say Earth got a Pit My Ride special and it's covered in exhaust for some reason. At the equator, the sun is absolutely roasting the air. That air rises like smoke from a campfire, carrying all the water with it. And as it rises, it cools. It dumps out water as rain. Boom, you get rain for us. Well, it skipped a couple steps in the creation of rainforest, but you get the gist. Now, that dried out air doesn't just disappear. It drifts north and south, precisely at 30 degrees latitude, right where our dry zone sits, before crashing back down to Earth. We call these Hadley cells. When air sinks, it does three things. It compresses, it heats up, and it sucks moisture out of everything. That's the Earth engine we're talking about, running 24-7, 365 days a year, right over the Sahara, Middle East, and Central Asia. So, while researching this whole atmospheric effect, I found out that the areas around 30 degrees latitude are actually called horse latitudes. And I thought, why horses? Were horses somehow part of the explanation behind this dry section of Earth? Turns out, yeah, sort of, just not in a good way. See, back in the day, sailors were paid partly in advance before a long voyage. Naturally, they'd spend it all before even leaving port. So for the first month or two at sea, they were basically working off their debt, what they called dead horse time. When that debt was finally repaid, they'd make a straw horse, parade it around the deck, and toss it overboard to celebrate. Yeah, and since ships sailing west from Europe would reach these calm windless zones right about then, the name stuck, Horse Latitudes. But there's also another darker theory. When Spanish ships carried real horses to the Americas, they sometimes got stranded there for weeks with no wind and dwindling water, and the animals didn't always make it. Let's just say it rained horses, a mer time massacre, if you will. And finally, the least depressing theory, in old sailor lingo, a ship was said to be horsed when it drifted with the current despite no wind, basically riding the ocean like a horse. So if you're stuck but still moving, congrats, you're in the horse attitudes. But enough horsing around. So that's it. Mystery solved, right? Our 9,000 kilometer dry zone sits directly under one of Earth's atmospheric pressure cookers. But wait, if this system is so reliable, so perfectly predictable, why was the Sahara green just 8,000 years ago? What force could possibly turn a third of Africa into a tropical paradise and then flip it back to the world's largest desert? Slow down, I was getting to that point. Okay, so this is where the science gets a little bit mental. 8,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert, the anchor point of our entire 9,000 kilometer dry zone, was a tropical paradise. We're talking lakes the size of California, rivers flowing year round, crocodiles, hippos, people herding cattle across grasslands where nothing grows today. And you can find this evidence everywhere. 
cave paintings of giraffes in the middle of Algeria, fossilised fish in what's now pure sand, entire sediments buried under dunes. So what happened? Did our atmospheric engine break down? No. Something much bigger was controlling the engine itself. Earth wobbles. Like a spinning top that's running out of steam, our planet tilts and jiggles on cycles that last tens of thousands of years. 8,000 years ago, Earth's tilt was different, just slightly different, and that small change supercharged Africa's monsoon system. This monsoon became so powerful, it actually overwhelmed the descending drying air entirely. Rain poured into the Sahara for thousands of years straight, and the entire western end of our dry zone just turned green. Then gradually, the wobble reversed. The monsoon weakened, the dry air reasserted control, kind of like a jealous ex, and that's when the Sahara dried out again taking its place as the foundation of Earth's greatest continuous wasteland. Cool, makes sense. Difference of wobbles combined with the Hadley cell effect equals dryness. Case closed. Hang on. If just tiny orbital changes can transform the Sahara from paradise to wasteland, there must be something else controlling this massive dry zone. Why does the dryness suddenly break at certain points? And why are some parts of this region even more extreme than others? Okay, good point. Let's zoom in on the western edge of our dry zone where the Sahara meets the Atlantic Ocean. You'd think all that water would bring rain, right? Well, you'd actually be wrong. The coast is actually even drier than the interior. Welcome to one of the climate's cruelest tricks, cold ocean currents. The Canary Current brings ice cold water down from the North Atlantic. This chills the air above it, creating what's called a temperature inversion. Basically an invisible lid that traps dry air at the surface and blocks rain clouds from forming. So, Instead of the ocean breaking the dry pattern, it actually reinforces it. The western edge of our 9,000 km zone is locked in by cold water. You can see fog rolling in from the ocean, but it never really turns into rain. The cold air is too heavy, too stable. It just sits there, almost mocking our thirsty land. But oceans aren't the only factor in shaping this parched region. Our dry zone has some serious help from the landscape itself. Look at Iran, it's almost surrounded by water. With the Caspian Sea to the north and the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea to the south, it should be getting moisture from nearly every direction. Instead, most of Iran gets less rainfall than Phoenix, Arizona. And that's due to its natural shield system, the mountains. Yes, mountains act like giant squeegees. So when moist air hits the Zagros Mountains coming from the west, or the Albos Range from the north, it's forced upward, cools down, and dumps all its water on the windward side. By the time it gets to central Iran, it's completely wrung out. That's what's called a rain shadow, and our entire dry zone is surrounded by them. The Atlas Mountains guard the Western Sahara, the Ethiopian highlands block moisture from the south, the Zagros and Albos starve Iran, the Tian Shan and Pamir ranges cut off Central Asia from any moisture coming from the south. These mountains hoard all the moisture for themselves, leaving the interior bone dry. Okay. So we've got atmospheric systems, orbital mechanics, ocean currents, and mountain barriers all working to maintain this massive dry zone. Phew, that was a little bit more complicated than I thought. Hold up, why does the dryness suddenly stop in some places? Why isn't all of this latitude bone dry? What breaks the pattern? Okay, yes, you're right, the pattern isn't perfect. It has gaps, and those gaps tell us everything. Look at the eastern edge of our dry zone. It just stops. Right around northern India and southern China, the dryness gives way to some of the wettest places on Earth. The reason? Well, it's actually the monsoon system. It's so ridiculously powerful here that it overwhelms everything else. We're talking about moisture from the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, and the South China Sea all converging at once, plus the Himalayas acting like a giant wall that traps all that moisture over the land. This place is so ridiculously wet, my girlfriend told me to take notes. The descending dry air from the Hadley circulation tries to do its thing, but it just gets decimated by this massive influx of tropical moisture. That's why our dry zone has such a sharp eastern boundary. The atmospheric engine that creates dryness is still there, but it's being overridden by an even more powerful system. And if we go back to our western edge of the dry zone at the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, it starts to get a little bit ridiculous to think about. On the one hand, you have the eastern edge of our dry zone ending because of too much moisture from the powerful monsoons, and yet the western edge is locked in by cold ocean water that prevents any moisture from reaching land. The dry zone is basically trapped between two opposing forces, and everything in between stays desert. 
Right, so there's a lot that goes into it. And as much as we've tried to provide a generalistic overview, there's even more happening behind the scenes to keep this part of our planet perpetually parched. Wait up, so if all these conditions have to come together to create this enormous dry patch of Earth, why does it only happen here? Well, actually, I've been lying to you. Our location isn't as unique as it looks. The truth is, Earth has a matching set of dry belts wrapped around both hemispheres. Yes, those horse latitudes exist on both ends of our planet, just mirrored. The same combo, Hadley cell subsidence, cold coastal currents, and mountain range shadows builds parallel dry belts in the south. In South America, the Atacama sits under the subtropical high and a cold upwelling along the Peru Humboldt current, which caps clouds with a temperature inversion while the Andes blocks moisture from the Amazon. That's why parts of the Atacama are the driest non-polar places on Earth. Slide across to Southern Africa and you meet the Namib-Kalahari duo. The Benguela current chills the Atlantic edge into a fog desert, while the regional subtropical high keeps air sinking and clear. Great for time lapses, terrible for rain. Then there's our home, Australia. Most of the continent sits beneath the subtropical ridge, a semi-permanent high pressure belt and the Great Dividing Range rings out onshore moisture before it can reach the interior. Classic continent scale rain shadow. Result, the world's second driest inhabited continent with vast interior deserts. Even North America gets a taste. The North American monsoon blasts summer moisture into the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts. But outside that window, the subtropical high reasserts itself. Proof, the dry by default rule is global and the exceptions are all about your local plumbing. But Here's the million dollar question. If we can map these pattern breakers so precisely, what happens when the patterns themselves start to shift? And with our climate reshuffling weather systems globally, could this ancient dry zone be about to change completely? See, climate change makes things hotter. And in doing so, it's shifting the entire atmospheric circulation system. The Hadley cells that create our dry zone are expanding. The subtropical high pressure systems are getting stronger and staying in place longer. In some parts of our dry zone, the desert is advancing. The Sahara is creeping south into the Sahel. Parts of Iran and Afghanistan are getting even drier. Central Asian rivers are drying up faster than ever. But in other areas, the pattern is breaking down completely. Parts of the Arabian Peninsula are getting more frequent rainfall. Monsoon patterns are shifting, potentially bringing more moisture into Central Asia. We're seeing rain in places that haven't had measurable precipitation in decades. Remember the Green Sahara? Those orbital cycles are still happening. In about 15,000 years, give or take, the Sahara could naturally flip green again. But we're not waiting for natural cycles anymore. We're conducting the largest uncontrolled climate experiment in Earth's history, and these dry zones are our laboratory. We're pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, shifting ocean currents, changing the strength of monsoons. The same forces that created this continuous wasteland millions of years ago, atmospheric circulation, ocean currents, mountain range shadows, are all being disrupted simultaneously. It's getting harder and harder harder to predict what comes next. The dry areas of our blue planet have not been left up to chance. We're not seeing an accident of geology, but rather an intersection of sciences, all working together to create Earth's grandest continuous wasteland. Almost like nature's trying to keep all the good green stuff away from us. We see you nature. But calling it a wasteland misses the point entirely. This zone is alive with its own unique beauty. Soxol trees that tap into underground water reserves in the Gobi. Oryx adapted to survive without drinking vomuts in the Arabian sands. Salt flats in Iran that shimmer like mirrors. Sand dunes that sing in frequencies you can feel in your chest. Rock formations that have been carved by the wind over millions of years into shapes that look otherworldly. Life here didn't give up, it adapted, and so did we. This zone has shaped human history in profound ways. It's created natural barriers between civilizations, forced mass migrations, influenced the rise and fall of empires. The Silk Road existed partly because this dry zone created a natural corridor across Asia. The Persian Empire, the Arab Caliphates, Central Asian kingdoms, all adapted their entire civilizations to thrive in this vast empty. But now, for the first time in Earth's history, we might be about to reshape this ancient pattern ourselves. Yet, even as we alter these forces, the planet will adjust. 
life will find new balances. The dry zone that has defined geography for millions of years may start looking different by the end of this century, but it will still be shaped by the same fundamental physics just playing out on a faster timeline than Mother Nature anticipated. Wilfred Thesiger spent years crossing the empty quarter of Arabia in the 1940s, one of the harshest parts of this 9,000 kilometer dry zone. He wrote, In the desert, I had found a freedom unattainable in civilization, a life unhampered by possessions, since everything that was not a necessity was an encumbrance. I had found too, a comradeship inherent in the circumstances and the belief that tranquility was to be found there. Our planet's deserts are home to millions, a sanctuary to some and one of Earth's most powerful shapers of life and civilization. These dry lands matter. They always have and hopefully always will. As always, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more of our videos on the secret of our vast blue home, be sure to give us a like and subscribe. Every little bit helps. Until next time, and stay moisturized. It's dry out there.